as you are about to notice. I do not have the artistic ability that Pastor Nan does. Um, and what little I did have was cut off at the bottom by the printer. So <laughs> if you want something fancy and flashy, come back next week. Pastor Dan will draw something for you. But um, for now, we're going to work our way through this worksheet that's meant to help organize my craziness upstairs. Um, let's turn this a little bit. So as I was, I was reading and I was praying about what I wanted to talk about, I found myself overcomplicating a lot. And long story short, I, I thought about and I prayed about so many different topics, and it, it came back to it's a lot simpler than I think it is. Um, and I think... And, and I'm going to get to this point by the end, but I think we all do that a little bit. We overcomplicate things a little bit um, more than we need to. Um, but so we're going to talk about some simple, small numbers. Um, and probably perfect day for that. We have small numbers here. Um, but we're, uh, I'm hoping that I can help somebody learn something at the very least. And um, hopefully God will be speaking through me. So, starting from the top, um, what I believe is the simplest, most straightforward, is uh, number one, which in my reading, my research, I found it's used like upwards of 2,000 times in the Bible, which, you know, one means a lot of things. It's uh, used in conversation a lot, but that's a lot of times. Um, but there are a few very important instances of the number one symbolism to that in the Bible. And um, to me, the first thing that, that pops out of me when I'm trying to overthink the number one is uh, that there is only one God, right? We're Christian, Christians... Uh, believe in a monotheistic religion, which basically means there's one deity, one God. Um, and anyone who cares much for history or pays attention in their history classes would know um, there are a lot of people, mostly in the past, but there have been a lot of people that believe there were a lot of gods, especially um, those that the Jews interacted with. Um, even up to the point of you know, the Romans, when when Jesus was alive, uh, believed in many many gods, and um, so first verse that we're going to take a look at today, and we're going to read is Deuteronomy four five. Uh, I'm going to be reading out of the CSB. If anyone is is uh, curious or wants to read the same translation. It's kind of back and forth. I do think some of the verses um, that we're going to look at today read a little bit. The irony of this is kind of uh, still funny to me, but I read a little more clearly. But um, I generally read CSB, so that's what I'm going with. Um, so Deuteronomy 4 5. Says, look, I have taught you. Statutes and ordinances, this is not the right verse, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 6.4, I've messed this up already. Deuteronomy 6.4, listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, let me read five as well. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, and so that's... The blank right under number one there is that reference Deut Deuteronomy 6 4. I need to correct on my own paper. So that lays it out pretty clearly. Um, for anybody who had questions of how many gods there were involved in creating the world, the Lord is one. 
and we need to love that one God with all our heart. Um, and so those four blanks to the right of the reference, kind of to the right, if you tilt your paper funny, uh, is uh, the Lord is one. So I'm going to go into the blanks, but uh, one, in, in a lot of the reading that I did, one signifies um, wholeness. It is, it's been declared that the Lord is one. The Lord is, you know, our whole focus as Christians is to be like the Lord, be like Jesus. Um, but as we'll talk about later, and most Christians know, Jesus and the Father were one. Um, so the Lord is one. Wholeness is portrayed in that word, one. Um, and, and that came a little bit from, I, I'm no s scholar on it, I don't know Hebrew, but that came a little bit from the reading that I did about the Hebrew character for one, is that it kind of um, signifies wholeness in the way that it's used. Um, and the blanks across the top, uh, one, cannot be multiplied or divided by itself. I left, I left that part out of the blanks, but by itself. Um, if you multiply one by one, you still have one. If you try and divide the one, you still have one, right? So you're not going to, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to find God split on an issue. You're not going to be able to uh, find a way to spin it that God is more than one, um, not realistically not following the teachings that we find in the Bible anyways. Um, and that's kind of the simple one, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, so there's not as much to that one, but we'll kind of come back to the number one in a minute here. Uh, so with the number two, multiplication becomes possible. So multiply two by two and you have four. Your numbers have grown. Uh, so the first verse that we're going to read about the number two is Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 11. Pages to flip. So Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 11 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone keep warm? Um, and then I want to jump right into the next verse before I talk about that at all. It's Genesis 1, 24 through 31. Which is a little bit longer. Arden, you want to read that for us? Genesis 1. Genesis 1. 24 through 31. Then God said, Let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. It will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image, created him in the image of God, created them male and female. 
God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every fish that they crawl on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This food will be for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food, and so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The evening came, and the morning was the sixth day. Okay, so there's seven blanks over on the right, and I've given you an E in the fourth blank. Um, anyone, any ideas what we might be putting in there based on what we just read? I can, I can tell you that um, <clears throat> Say, my paper says, beasts of the earth created in pairs. Um, I'm, you know, shorthanding it a little bit, leaving out some of the small words, maybe. But um, God creates the beasts of the earth. He creates them according to their kind. And he creates them male and female. So he creates one male, one female. He says, go and multiply and fill the earth, more or less. Um, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, to be more exact. Um, and then in the blank below, I have man also to, most of these already filled in, should I add also, uh, which he doesn't create Eve, uh, no, it does say he created them man and female in this verse. So yeah, right there. Um, so at this point, he's already created a man and a woman. Two, two men, humans, however you'd like to say it. Um, go forth, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish and the birds, and you know, um, just to go out and Fulfill that duty, and it's a command, right? So, and I, I think as far as that, people have generally done a pretty good job. We're all over the place. Um, <clears throat> but the blanks over to the left with some arrows pointing up, um, I just read this straight out of the dictionary. Was it? You know, I had read 15 verses at this point, researching a little bit, and I was like, you know, what does multiplication mean um, and straight out of the dictionary there's a couple of definitions but the most straightforward one was increase in number um, and so I've got that in that blank there and so God wants us to go creates us in a pair there's definitely a meaning there and then wants us to multiply increase in number the way that we were designed, we need a pair to increase in number. And I think that that goes to um, apply also to ministry, uh, which I'm about to read about in a second. But we aren't designed to be alone. We're designed to be, if nothing else, in the church with those around us that can support us. Um, really designed to be in a pair, husband and wife, to um, to multiply, to have children. You know, it, it's commanded right there, very clearly. Go for the multiply. Uh, but if nothing else, um, we we need to be in the church, fellowshipping, um, because I'm sure that we've all seen the person who's alone, nobody to nobody to back them up, nobody to talk to, and it puts them in a pretty rough spot. Um, which leads me into the next verse, which is Matthew. Or I'm sorry. Let me go back to uh, <clears throat> let me go back to Ecclesiastes real quick. Sorry. Um, but so now, knowing you were created in a pair, 
designed to be in a pair, and then we jump forward, and we hear you know, talking to the Jewish people. Uh, I, I can't remember off the t top of my head who who wrote Ecclesiastes, but um, two are better than one because they have great reward for their efforts. If either falls, his companion can lift him up. If you're, there, if you're struggling by yourself, if you just had somebody with you, they could help you, right? If they lie down together, they can keep warm. You know, if a man lies down in his bed every night or a woman lies down in their bed every night, year after year after year by themselves, it gets kind of cold, kind of lonely, right? Because um, we were designed to be in a pair. We'll jump to Matthew 18, 20 now. Um, Matthew 18, 20. It says, For where two or three are gathered together, in my name, I am there among them. And this is Jesus talking. So we got some the blanks across the bottom. There's three blanks uh, with a question mark and then four blanks below. And I've got two or three. The Lord is there. Um, and so this... As I was praying on this, you know, you may come to find different meaning in it, or there is a more literal meaning. But as I was praying and meditating on this verse, especially in context of the previous passages, I I came to realize, which I mean I already knew to an extent, but I came to know um, that if we if we do not go out into the world to minister and to, to visit, to share God with support, even if they're not physically with us, if we have the church behind us, or we have a team back in the church that we can come back to and we can bring people to, or we have our pastor that we can refer people with complicated questions to, hopefully we just know the answer, but if you don't have support of other believers... God might not be there to back you up. That's kind of hard to hard to swallow, but um, it's there, right? Now it doesn't say the Lord won't be with you if you're if you don't have two, but it says if there's two or three, the Lord will be there. If you want to know that God's going to be there with you, bring your Christian friend, right? Bring your pastor with you. Um, sorry, I lost my spot here. Let me read Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but there's a lot of uh, scripture that adds context to. It what I'm thinking about here and what God's been telling me. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says, Iron sharpens iron, and one person sharpens another. So not only will God be with us if we go as two or more believers out in the world, two or three believers, but we will be made stronger. We'll be made sharper be more prepared if we have another with us. So, kind of the moral of the story of those parts are we got to go together. Um, we have to fellowship. We have to work together. Kind of bounce off of one another. Our knowledge or our skills. If If, say, 
my pipes burst in my house under my house I'm not gonna know what to do maybe I could call a plumber um, but the I know that there are people within the church you know Tim probably Tony I, I don't know if I've known you to do much plumbing but I know that there are people within the church that I could call that could give me advice that could help me um, if I weren't part of the church the best thing, the closest, <laughs> the closest thing I could do to getting that fixed is call a plumber, maybe watch a bunch of YouTube videos and mess it up even worse. Um, but we make each other stronger, not only by physically being with each other, but by being able to work together, add to each other's knowledge, multiply our skills to use for God and to make an impact on the other people in the church and those who don't know God that we want we want to show, we want to leave an impression that we're living for God. <clears throat> and so um, I have just above where it says, what is it? Um, two blanks, should be the last two blanks under two, I believe. Nope, there should be uh, one more. But uh, the M is for multiplication, and the C is for the church. So with multiplication, when two or more believers gather, the Lord is there. When two or more believers gather, and they are on fire for God, and they go out, and they are telling people, you will multiply, you'll have three, four, five, however many believers coming together, and you will have a church. The church is the people. They don't need a building. Um, I, this is a big sermon that stuck with me a really long time ago, and I do not have all the scripture and all of the, um, all of the, I guess, kind of receipts to, to, <laughs> to reference back to, but the church is the people, and if we didn't have a building, and if we met in the middle of the street every week, or every day, or once a month, whatever it was, we would still be the church when we came together and met in that street and worshipped God and learned about Him together and fellowshiped. That's the church. Um, <clears throat> and with multiplication comes the church and with the church hopefully comes more multiplication um, and I have a reference that I'm missing I spent more time preparing this and, and I know I'm kind of scatterbrained it's all over the place but I still I'm not very good at preparing uh, but I spent more time preparing this than I've probably gone out of my way to prepare anything in the last decade so I, you know, I've never studied. I never like I, I'm big. Like, I had a speech in school. I wing it. Um, but so I, I really don't know how to prepare <laughs> just to get that message across. Uh, it's Matthew. Hold on. Let me make sure this is actually it before I tell you. Yes, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, um, which is also commonly known. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I think I misspoke there. Which is also commonly known as the Great Commission. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me on heaven in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so, to me, that just wraps this all up nicely to say, it's our job to multiply the church. It's our job to multiply more believers spread the word and 
to show people that what God's all about. There are a lot of people, maybe they don't want to hear it, but there are a lot of people that really need to hear it. Maybe they do want to hear it, maybe they've never heard it, whatever their situation is that we need to tell. I think part of the reason why those verses are so famous is because it's a clear command. It's very simple. What you need to do, you need to go and tell people. Say, make disciples of everyone. Just tell them about God. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them everything I have taught you, essentially pretty obvious to me, right? Um, and, and it's very powerful, and it's, yeah, it, it's a great calling for us as Christians and what we need to do. I'm going to try and move along through three a little bit faster here. I do, unfortunately, have to leave for, to go back to work <laughs> pretty soon here. Like I said, it's been a really crazy day. Um, but so the number three in my reading is also very commonly used um, and the most common trend I see with the number three and just make clear nothing that you know none of these trends that I'm seeing are the only things that these numbers mean in the Bible there's a lot more um, like they're used for mo- many things uh, I read quite a bit about like negative uses of two and three. Um, yeah, I didn't really even touch on it all, but when they're using a negative context, like um, Peter denying Jesus three times, for example. Um, but number three generally s- symbolizes completeness um, from what I'm reading uh, to me. And what, what God has told me. Um, I'm not just making this stuff up. <laughs> um, but so, for the right, uh, Jesus prays three times in Gethsemane. I'm going to read Matthew 26, 36, which is where that comes from. Sorry. That is not... Oh, maybe it is... Yes. Um, So Jesus came with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he told them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this I cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Um, And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. And after leaving them, he went again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. So this is, Jesus is about to be betrayed. What from the appearance, actually he says while he was still speaking. Um, you know, that minute, he's about to be betrayed. But he's praying, and he knows it. He gets up and tells his disciples it's about to happen, but yet he's still praying. If there is any other way, let it be that way. Let it be taken away from me. But your will be done, Lord. So he prays three times in Gethsemane for um, what, what is to come to be taken away from him. Um, there are three Passovers in Jesus' ministry, and I'm not going to read it all, all the verses, but um, John notes all of them, 2.13, John 6.4, and John 11.55. 
Um, there are three Passovers from when Jesus goes out in the world with the disciples to the time of his death, which is roughly three years that his ministry goes on. Um, and then the most, probably the most notable, uh, which I have blanks here for the verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Jesus rises again after three days. So in each of those instances, so Jesus is not done praying until he's prayed three times. Jesus' ministry is complete after three years. Jesus' resurrection comes to be in its fullness after three days. And... <clears throat> touch on that again in a second here. In the top left, I have a triangle, at which I've marked Trinity for you. Um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, let me use my phone to pull these up, It'll be a little bit quicker. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is one God, the Father. All things are from Him, and we exist for Him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through Him, and we exist through Him. Um, so I've got that top blank as Father, and then 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the top of the triangle there. Um, and then... That also they mention one Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the bottom left, we've got Son, and then in Colossians 2 9, Jesus reiterates and he says, <clears throat> For the entire fullness of God's, I'm sorry, not Jesus speaking, but it's reiterated that Jesus is. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Um, reiterating again, Jesus and God are one being. Fullness of Christ, the fullness of God the Father is in Christ, and they are both one Lord, our one Lord. <clears throat> and then when we go to 2 Corinthians 3.17, Is now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then, the, so in the bottom right corner of the triangle, I've got Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3.17, right below it. Um, I'm not going to go super in-depth about the Holy Spirit. Of course, that's a pretty deep to topic, but um, the Holy Spirit is the Lord, Right? Is, or I'm sorry, the Lord is the Spirit. It's laid out pretty clearly there. Um, and so we have this Trinity, this complete figurehead, or Godhead, as I've heard it said, three in one, um, that our belief is completely revolves around. Um, and three parts of the Trinity, kind of what it means, Trinity. Um, Jesus prays three times. There are three years in Jesus' ministry. Jesus rises after three days. Um, and a little fun fact about that, as I was reading, I came to learn that it was um, like a, after three days, Jewish people believed you were, that was when you're fully dead and your spirit left the world and what baseness, what base there is to that, I don't know. Um, I, I feel that's you know, probably a little superstitious personally, but I don't know for, for a fact how that, how it all plays out. But the Jewish people at that time believed after three days you were fully dead, you were done, right? So Jesus, after three days, coming back, 
even adds, just makes, gives more punctuality to the point that Jesus is conquering death. Um, <clears throat> and so we have these numbers. Simple, one, two, three. One of the first things we learn, uh, academically speaking, as, as humans um, and they all, all of those things, even though they, they kind of mean different things individually, they tie together to create our beliefs. Um, that there's one God, three parts, but one God, or three forms, I should say, but one God. And if you know our one God, and you know that he is one, and you love him with all your heart, then you will go as a pair, who goes two or more, into the world and tell all those in the world that are alone, that don't know God, that don't they haven't seen what we've seen. And you'll tell them about Jesus. And you'll tell them about his three years, his three prayers, his three days, and they will hopefully, someone's going to, maybe not, Definitely not everybody. There will definitely be people that don't want to hear it. But they will come, and they will multiply, and they will join the church. And we will fulfill our command from Jesus to make more believers. And it will all come full circle. It's the day that we go to heaven, and we get to be there with the one true God in heaven for all of eternity. Um, and now that wraps it all up um, but I want I'm hoping that someone at least one person in this room learned something from that um, I sure learned a lot um, but the the concepts and the small things I've learned and the things that I remember from studying this, I will apply to many other things as I as I study in the future and kind of build on the basics. Um, and I think that sometimes that's what we need to do is just go back to basics, even if I can even make the basics very complicated and scatterbrained. <laughs> but um, I think that these numbers come up so much, it, it would be silly for us not to talk about them at least a little bit. Um, so I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll go to some fellowship. I have to leave, unfortunately, but um, I have some fellowship for a few minutes and then go home. Lord, thank you for this day. Pray that you are with each one of us as we go out into the world. And that we can go, we make believers, we make disciples of, of men everywhere we go. Um, thank you for giving us your word, giving us something to, to study, to learn, so that we can know more, so we can draw, draw closer to you. Um, in black and white, it's right there in front of us. And I'm so grateful for that, Lord. Um, I thank you for those of us who are able to be here today. Uh, I pray for those traveling, that you would help them be safe, that they would learn something and have a fulfilling experience uh, for you at the, the National Convention, Lord. And um, I, I just pray that you watch over us, um, bring us providence in our daily endeavors. In Jesus' name, amen.